All right, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for staying for my talk after Tim's. Um, <laughs> slight difference between the two of us. He's got 50,000 followers on Twitter. I've got 200. <laughs> anyway, so last year I spoke about nutritional ketosis and it was the first one for the morning and it was pretty technical. It was a lot of biochemistry and there's a lot of sleepy faces in the audience. So I've decided to keep it relatively light this year. Um, and I'm just going to talk about my perspective as a general practitioner in Melbourne um, for health and the role of low carb, high fat um, nutrition in health. So a bit about me, which Rod's pretty much already told you all, but uh, yep, yeah, been working as a doctor for about 10 years. I wear a couple of hats, work as a GP, do a bit of sports medicine, uh, work for the uh, Melbourne footy team as well. So yeah, watch this space. And like a lot of us up here, we've had our own sort of personal problems with weight or health or, or one of those things and mine was weight and obviously health with that as well and changing my nutrition around and just understanding about what food is and what food does helped me lose a, a fair bit of weight. And here you can see a bit of a difference. I love showing this slide up to us, anyone who will see. And the obvious differences are the loss of weight and back in 2010, selfies weren't really the rage, so <laughs> I had to get someone else to take a photo. And the hair going missing on my chest was not the diet, it was wax ink. But <laughs> that's a talk for another audience, another day, probably. So a little bit about my professional and personal journey. So uh, without going into great detail, I, I lost that weight. And it, it happened slowly, and my way of eating um, you know, I looked at lots of different literature and, and read a lot of books and research by a lot of the audience, uh, the presenters here today. And yeah, I made the weight loss, but more than anything, I had the health gains. I lost a lot of my gastrointestinal symptoms of distress. I had more energy. I was happier. Um, and then sort of I had a light bulb moment, moment and thought, how can I apply this to my patients? Um, and so I started treating patients in general practice, the ones that were open to it. Um, first and foremost by using nutrition and, and lifestyle measures um, and seeing if that made a difference to a lot of the ailments that people came in with. Um, and the, the main crux of this was really reducing your sugar intake, uh, getting rid of wheat, vegetable oils and increasing your fat, particular saturated fat. And it's really that last point which caused a lot of controversy um, amongst uh, some of my peers. So. I copped a lot of uh, criticism, um, a lot of ridicule from my friends. You know, we'd be out to dinner, people would be br uh, waving bread in my face saying, look, ooh, evil. Um, yeah, it got tiring after the fourth or fifth month in a row. But anyway, lots of personal attacks on me saying that, uh, you know, I'm going against science and what would I know? You know, I'm not, you know, an expert. I don't have a PhD. I haven't done any research. In fact, I was a pretty mediocre student in university, which probably helped. I didn't have to unlearn a lot of stuff to learn the new stuff. <laughs> Um, so some of my friends told me, yep, you're going against a scientific consensus and, you know, it's going to end up in tears for you and the medical board, we're going to tell the medical board and, you know, they're going to stop you practicing. And that led to a loss of a few friendships, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way the way it goes when, and when people have a lot of cognitive dissonance, which um, Professor Noakes touched on the meaning of that. So I just found myself not able to practice standard nutritional advice to patients um, following a one-size-fits-all model with the food pyramid because yeah, for some people that may work but for the vast majority of people that come in with a medical problem there's some sort of metabolic dysregulation and they're the ones that would be least advantaged to use the food pyramid as a guide so with them uh, I, I gave them um, a, a sort of a template to use in, in nutrition. Um, and just touching on that as well, what, what is the role of a doctor? I mean, the word doctor comes from the Latin word uh, docere, which I'm probably not pronouncing properly, but anyway. Um, and really, it means teacher. It comes from the word teacher. And really, to be a good teacher, you have to have the ability to learn. And I think there's three fundamental principles to be a good teacher in anything that you need to have. Is one is to have always have an open mind. Uh, the other thing is to have the courage to you know, throw out ideas that aren't working anymore. Um, and also that understand that scientific tr truth isn't final. The, our understanding of science will be constantly evolving. We're never going to reach the pinnacle of knowledge. So we've got to, we've got to um, 
embrace that and be and be ready to make changes and I like this little picture here on the side where you can see things have gone full circle a little bit. So the next question is what is LCHF? Um, I, I don't particularly like using labels but really it's about getting back to real food um, and I don't when you work one-on-one -on -one with patients it's not about following a template for everyone. There's a lot of variability but it really goes back down to um, eating real food and rather than focusing on the things that you can eat, think about the things that really are important to eliminate or minimise such as the sugar, the processed food, the vegetable oils, um, a lot of the grain based products that are highly refined and, and adding back um, more fat through natural sources. And one of my observations in GP is that and, and, and all of us sort of propose, um, trying, to, trying to push the, the message here of, of looking after our health through a dietary changes of low carb and high fat, is that we really need a uniform message. You know, we're not going to be able to make a change if there's infighting amongst ourselves. And, and whether that's, you know, whether you want to put yourself in a box of conventional medicine versus alternate medicine, it, it should really be about medicine helping people and, you know, yeah, infighting between whose territory is it? Is it the dietitian's territory or the doctor's territory to talk about um, nutrition and food? Who's more qualified? I, I think that you're missing the point if you get in the semantics of that. And I, I've learned a lot from some fantastic, amazing dietitians, and and I've learned a lot from some fantastic di uh, doctors, and I've learned a lot from people that aren't even in the scientific realm. And and I think that needs to continue. We shouldn't be boxing ourselves off in in separate sort of categories too much. And the whole aspect of people saying, oh, are you paleo or are you ketogenic or are you LCHF or are you Western Price or are you Primal or whatever label you want it to it, it really should be under the umbrella of eating real food, real nutrition um, to try to minimise um, health problems. And again, it's not one size fits all. I don't sit down in a consult and say, everyone have however many grams of carbs or however many grams. I mean, I've never actually measured a, a carbohydrate in my life when I've been doing this diet for four, four years. So I, I really talk about just the food quality, have realistic and sustainable goals. And I, I try to use the analogy of you know, the old radios that had the big tuning knob and there was a smaller fine tuning knob. Get the, big, get the big tuning knob right in the right area and then we can worry about the fine tuning down the track. And more than anything, it's not a competition. It's not a competition to see who can be the healthiest or who's got the best HbA1c or who can lose the most weight. Now we're all trying to live a healthy, happy life, um, and we need to avoid dogma and alienation, um, and be respectful of people that don't really agree with your view. With your view, and just just keep keep trying, keep keep talking to them, show by example, and try and avoid confirmation bias. Now, it's very easy for me to come up here and talk to the audience today about low carb, high fat, because that's what everyone's here to come and come and uh, hear. And um, I, I really think what Troy and um, um, Professor Noakes did a couple of days at the diabetic conference was, was really amazing and took a lot of courage to go in there and, and talk to an audience and talk with and debate against people that don't have that view and I think that we've got to continue to do that. Um, it'd be great next year if we could have some speakers at this conference that wanted to pose an opposing view and people could just take both sides of the message and, and, and see what comes of that. And of course, it's not just nutrition, it's not just what you eat that makes someone healthy. And these are some of my observations from general practice. It's really, there's a whole other f set of factors as well. So I think exercise or physical activity, whether that's movement, flexibility, getting the right balance of that. I can't stress how important sleep is, both the quantity and the quality. Um, Realising that there's going to be stress in life all the time and, and we've got to find successful ways of dealing with it. Um, and a lot of people that come to me have had years and years of issues with food and, 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 and warped um, relationship with food, tried yo-yo dieting their whole lives. And it's almost fundamental to try and um, address that just as much as what they're eating, you know, why they've got to this point. Having realistic expectations is very important. Um, other things that are important, sort of sun exposure, um, you know, minimising pollutant toxins, uh, genetics, epigenetics, you know, I think it's very important to have a sense of community or unconditional love in your life as well, whether you're surrounded by family and friends. I mean, we always talk about hunter-gatherer populations, you know, how they lived long and all of this, but they had a community lifestyle and it wasn't every man for themselves. Um, 
And yeah, the last one, sex and intimacy is pretty important too. So, you know, there's a doctor prescribing that for you. <laughs> <laughs> So for the last part of my talk, I'm just going to talk through a couple of cases of patients that I've personally treated. Um, they're all anonymous. You know, there's no major, I mean, the stories where you see the, the huge story, the huge photos of weight loss and that, that's, that's fantastic. But I'm just going to talk about a general few stories, a uh, few cases. Now this is only anecdotal, obviously. I don't have the ability to do randomised controlled trials in my clinic and all the funding for it, but this is the best I've got at the moment. Um, so, first case is a 29-year-old female. She's got a past history of lactose intolerance, fructose malabsorption, IBS. And you can see how you know three of those things are probably under the same umbrella. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, and she's had irregular periods most of her life. And the first time I saw her was in April 2013. Uh, she was on she was on the pill to to manage her symptoms. She was 82 kilograms at the time, and there was, there was talk of working her up um, laparoscopically to to look at endometriosis and a few other things. At the time, she'd seen a gynaecologist who'd said, you know, it's going to be pretty tricky for you to try and get pregnant in the future, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. And at that time, most of her bloods were actually pretty good. Um, fasting sugars were okay, fasting insulin was good too, and suddenly she did have a high two-hour insulin after a glucose tolerance test. Um, so there were, and there were clinical signs of insulin resistance, so distribution of fat was mainly around her abdomen. So we, I started on a low carb, high fat diet, and she was very naive to this, and you know, it took a little while to get her going, and she said, you know what, I've tried everything else, I may as well give this a go. And it was fantastic. She found it really easy. Um, she found all her gastrointestinal symptoms disappeared. She felt better. She's not, this is someone that doesn't really like exercising. She started losing weight. She came off the pill. Her periods got regular. Her, her PMS symptoms disappeared. Uh, and she felt pregnant actually two, two months before her wedding. Uh, well, I don't know if that was a goal, but and her last HbA1c was 5.2. So the, it's not a dramatic story or anything, but you can make a difference in someone's life um, by using this diet. Um, another another case I've got: 20-year-old male, elite athlete, plays AFL. Um, you know, his skin folds, which is a measurement from certain sites in the body. In May of 2014, we were 46.9. We started him on a, a modified version of this diet. Uh, he felt like his energy went up, um, felt lighter, he maintained his speed, so there was no uh, detriment in his performance. And the next time we did his skill, skin folds in July, that had gone down um, seven millimetres, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. And of course, there's a little bit of error, margin of error with, the, with taking these, but you know, that's a pretty significant result there as well. Uh, 39 year old female, long standing history of uh, inflammatory bowel, uh, um, irritable bowel symptoms. Saw her in November last year for the first time, and she had some, she had eight weeks of swelling, stiffness, pain in her fingers, the joints in her hands uh, on both sides, and we're worried about a, an, a, an arthritis or a rheumatoid arthritis. And most of her bloods came back pretty good. Um, she did have a slight rise in her. Her anti-CCP, which can indicate rheumatoid arthritis. She saw a rheumatologist who said, you know, we'll watch this space, um, you know, try some anti-inflammatories if it doesn't work, come and see me if it gets worse. And she came back and saw me and I said, well, why don't we try a dietary modification as well? You've got nothing to lose. Let's get you on an LCHF model. Um, with her, it was more about minimising her gluten intake. Um, and look, this doesn't prove anything, but after that we found that her IBS symptoms disappeared and she had no more joint um, pain or swelling. Um, I haven't repeated her bloods yet, but clinically she's tracking along really well. She's also noticing that the fatigue she used to get two hours after eating lunch has disappeared, her concentration's back, and, and she's feeling really good about it. So, you know, she's happy to carry on with that. Another lady here, 64-year-old female. I see a lot of females in this age bracket in, in patients. Um, now, this lady had a probably 30 or 30 plus year of yo-yo dieting, trying things like OptiSlim, um, severe caloric restriction, um, and she used to have what they call the J-curve effect. So she'd lose weight, go back to a normal caloric intake, and then her weight would shoot back up. And when I saw her weight were, was in the low to mid 60s, and this is after a, a several period of being on a really caloric restricted diet of the of the shakes. Um, she felt high, tired, low energy, and her, her weight had been up and fluctuated up. Close to 100 kilos, I think, at one stage. Now, 
I suggested, I mean, she sought me out after the conference last year, but I suggested we start her on a, a, on a low carb, high fat diet. And you know, this is someone that was really fat phobic her whole life. And I think a lot of you out there can probably relate to this. Now we didn't actually restrict calories now. And she found initially that she'd um, lost that hunger. She had increased energy, better sleep. And eventually, she was still anxious at first because she said, you know, I'm not losing the weight. Shouldn't the weight be dropping out? I see all in all these blogs that people just, the weight just flies off. And I said, look, think about health more than anything. And she started getting a better relationship with what she actually sees food. And, and she started focusing more on health. And she didn't actually have any weight change. And I haven't caught up for, with her for a, for a little while, but I still put this case up as a success story in my eyes, because it's not just about the weight, it's about the health and having the energy and being able to do your daily functions and not have to wait, not have to be hungry all the time and address those, those, those poor relationships with food. Um, I've got a couple more, go through them quickly. Uh, this is an interesting case as well, actually. This is a 40-year-old female who'd been doing low-carb, um, high-fat for the last eight years. So uh, well ahead of any of, uh, a lot of us on this panel as well. So she saw me in March, of this year, she was uh, 30 weeks pregnant, and the routine glucose tolerance test that you take when you're pregnant uh, showed that her one hour and two hour blood sugar levels were elevated. And she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes and sent to the, the Heart and Diabetes Institute at the Alpha, and, and the dietitian there told her that, look, you've got to follow the food pyramid and eat, you know, lots of whole grains and et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the, the typical diet that that the diet, uh, many dietitians in, in that place sort of tell patients to have. And she came and saw me and I thought, well, this doesn't make sense. If you're on a, if you're on a low carb, high fat diet, you really should be the most unlikely person to get um, gestational diabetes. And, and we, did, we did some tests again. I said, well, first of all, you're probably not ever gonna have 75 grams of glucose in your day, let alone one meal. So possibly over eight years of you not um, having a huge influx of glucose in your system, you, your pancreas probably hasn't had to work very hard. And when you when you when you sent this massive load into your system, your pancreas just wasn't. It was, just, it was kind of a bit sleepy. It wasn't able to put out all that insulin needed to get the glucose down. So, what I did was repeated her uh, glucose tolerance test, except I did it after a low carb, high fat meal, like her typical meal um, that she would have for breakfast, and her two hour post blood sugar was 4.7, her insulin was 7, which was very acceptable. And more importantly, her HbA1c, which I know can be a little bit unreliable if you go later on in pregnancy, but it was 4.5, so she was nowhere near her, you know, the diabetic threshold. So I told her to continue on with her, with her diet, not to worry about the gestational diabetes um, diagnosis. And her obstetrician was more than happy with this when I'd written a letter and explained. She had an uneventful pregnancy, healthy baby boy delivered at term. Um, and what do we got here? 32 year old female. She was a type one diabetic, diagnosed at age nine. Um, she has had HbA1c's as high as eight and nine in the past and she was inspired by um, Dr. Troy Stapleton last year. And I think he's inspired many, many type one diabetics out there. Uh, and she came to see me because she wanted to touch base with me because she did started uh, going a low carb ketogenic diet. By May of 2014, she'd lost weight. She had lower insulin requirements, better energy, better moods. Her HbA1c had dropped from five to 5.4. Yes, her total cholesterol had gone up, but her HDL went up. Her triglycerides had gone down. Her LDL had gone up as well. But um, I'm sure the large particle size would have been. Uh, it would have been favourable, but the endocrinologist only focused on the LDL. He didn't worry about the triglycerides, he didn't look at the HbA1c, didn't look at her control and her health, and he just wanted to put her on statins and said what she was doing was very dangerous. But, you know, so that's another interesting story. It, it does take time, but um, the last case, uh, is this, no, I've got two more to go, sorry. Just go through this quickly. 26-year-old uh, female. She's had GI problems her whole life. Thoroughly investigative gastroscopy, colonoscopy, pill cam. No diagnosis was ever made. She was prescribed Nexium and told we're not really sure what's wrong with you. She was up taking up to 80 milligrams of Nexium a day. I spoke to her and told her about this diet. I said you've got nothing to to, to lose. Try it. Uh, look, her weight hasn't shifted, but she's feeling better in herself. She doesn't have any more symptoms. She hardly takes Nexium unless she 
is going to take some medication that may interfere with their gut. Um, and this is another, another one of those stories where a simple lifestyle measure can make such a difference. Now, the last case is one of my favourites because um, she's a 54-year-old female. She's got a past history of being overweight, poor diet, anxiety. And she came and saw me in March 2014, weighing 100 kilograms of the body mass, body mass index of 30. Fasting blood sugar was 13.6. Now, that's, that's very high. That's an automatic diagnosis of diabetes. It's pretty alarming, really. And our HbA1c at the time was 9.6. Triglycerides were elevated, LDL were quite low. She had elevated liver enzymes, you can see there, the, the, the ALP, GGT, et cetera, et cetera. And her liver size was enlarged, was consistent with fatty liver. Her liver was 23.5 millimetres. Now, when I first saw her, she was really stressed about this. She was worried about what this meant. And she said, I really don't want to go on medication. What can I do? Uh, she sought me out. So I said, all right, let's try diet first and, and nutrition. And with this person, I said, we're going to be very restrictive with you because you're, you're really far off where you want to be. So diligently, she started a low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. Um, she hasn't been on medication. Now, it's still early days. And this is not con you know, conclusive evidence for anything, but it's, it's a good story so far. So. Of the, in this month, she's had 10 kilogram weight loss. Her BMI is down to 27. Her fasting blood sugars are usually about four or five most mornings. Her HbA1c has dropped to 5.4, which is in your normal range. Her trigs have come down to 1.2 and her HDL has gone up. Uh, her liver enzymes have pretty much normalized and her liver size has gone back into the normal range of uh, 15 centimeters. More importantly, she's got no more constant hunger, no more anxiety. She's got better exercise tolerance, better sleep. And like I said, there's still a long way to go to consolidate these, this and to undo all the years of poor nutrition, but that's a pretty great result, I think. And um, it shows what you can do with diet without having to resort to medication. Um, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't try medication if they don't need to, but really diet and exercise and, and lifestyle measures are really important to start with. So just to finish, I just want to make a couple of quick acknowledgements. So a lot of the people here presenting, uh, Rod Taylor, Ken Sikaris, Gary, Simon, uh, Grant, David Gillespie and Troy, Peter, Kieran, Charby, these people have helped me along my journey. Uh, I like this slide as well. I'm not sure if you can read it at the back, but it's a bunch of crazy people, including Christopher Columbus, who said the world wasn't flat. I've uh, got the Wright brothers that said we could fly and a few others there as well. So, you know, it's not crazy the notion of saying that uh, eating diet, um, real food is good for us. And I think most people get, you know, a bit freaked out when you say eat more fat. Uh, lastly, my greatest support has probably been my wife in this whole journey, who's really helped me get through a lot of the, the, the problems I had earlier on. She's supported me with my experiments defended me, backed me, I've learned from her, she's taught me as well. And really what it comes down to is she's given me another re she's given me a reason to live a healthier life. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, she's kept me sane and she's also stopped me from obsessing too much. <laughs> so a couple of quotes to finish because quotes make me look smart and they're cool. Um, so this one here, there must be no barriers to freedom of inquiry. There is no place for dogma in science. The scientist is free and must be free to ask any question, to doubt any assertion, to seek for any evidence, to correct any errors. We know that the only way to avoid error is to detect it, and the only way to detect it is to be free to inquire. And we know that as long as men are free to ask what they must, free to say what they think, free to think what they will, freedom can never be lost and science can never regress. Thank you.